You've come today to hear from God. It is my prayer that as we join our hearts together in worship, both of those things will happen for you. Please join me in the call to worship. Gracious God, beloved of us all. Gracious God, beloved of us all. Gracious God, beloved of us all. Amen. Our hymn is number 345. Let us stand as we sing together.
please join me as we pray together the prayer of invocation. Let us pray. You know each of us by name, O God. In your sight we have found favor, yet our minds cannot comprehend the vision of your glory or the vastness of your love. Grant that as we glimpse your greatness reflected in your many gifts, we may always return to you the praise that is yours alone. Amen. You may be seated. I would like to invite the children to come forward for our children's moment. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? Everybody coming off of fall break? We had fall break this week. You had fall break, didn't you? Last week? Yeah? All right. Okay. Well, I've got something in my hand here. I want everybody to take a coin. Just one. Oh, you're going to take the big one. Uh Uh-huh. I see how you are. Just one. And you're going to take the small one. Uh Uh-huh. And a medium-sized one, okay. Come on, get a little closer. Where just, are these? Just, that's a coin. <laughs> oh, this, so this is a nickel. That's a nickel, uh-huh. And, all right. And let's see here. Got some coins here. Does anybody have a dime? There's a coin for you and a coin for you. Okay. Now, I want you to look at this coin. Look at the front of it. I've got a couple extra here. Uh, Yeah, heads. You might call it heads, because guess what? It's on there. It's a head, right? So who's on the front of your coin? You've got a penny. Who's on the front there? Do you know who that is? That's Abraham Lincoln. Do you know who's on the front of your coin? The biggest coin of all, the quarter. Actually, they're bigger, but for this today. George Washington. Good. What you got, Elijah? Who's on your coin? You got a nickel there? I had to ask who that was. The first one? Uh, who, who knows who's on a nickel? Thomas Jefferson, all right. Who's on, somebody have a dime there? Anybody have a dime down there? You have a dime down there? Who's, oh, don't eat it. <laughs> anybody have a dime? You got dimes. Who's on the dime? There's a, there's a, guy of a, a picture of a guy on the dime there. And that's called Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Okay, so... Some guys came to Jesus one day, and they said, Hey, Jesus, should we give these coins to Caesar? And you know what Jesus said? He said, Let me see that. And he said, Oh, there's a picture of Caesar, so give to Caesar what is Caesar's. So you've got, who, uh, remind me again who's on yours. Abraham Lincoln. So should you give Abraham Lincoln that penny? Yeah, you should? Okay. Should you give George Washington that quarter? Well, they're dead. No. How are you going to give Abraham Lincoln that penny? Oh, oh, give it to church. What do you think, Elijah? Like, um, send it to God. Send it to God. Well, you know what Jesus said after he said that? Tell God. Uh Uh-huh. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Or really it means give the government what is the government in our scenario. But give... God, what is God's? Well, what is God's? Everything. Everything. Give God everything, because everything is a gift from God. And we have to give every single human to God. And we have to give every single human to God, yeah. Let's give that human over there, and that human. Maybe not, okay, maybe even that human. Well, um, what, do I, what else do I have in my hands today? What is this? Do you guys know what this is? It's a it's a, a, somebody said a bowl, a hat, yeah, you could maybe wear it as a hat. <clears throat> it's an offering plate. And so in our worship service, we'll pass this down the pews, and everybody will get to touch it, and everybody will get to put their dollars and their coins and their million-dollar bills in there and things like that, right? So, so you got to give me back the money that I gave you, yeah? All right. And you know why we do this? Why do we put money in our offering plate? <laughs> All right. Yeah. You're having a hard time getting rid of that quarter, aren't you? Why do we do that? What do you think? To collect for the church. To collect for the church. Now, why does the church need coins oh, oh, and dollars? Oh. What do you think, Elijah? For the, for the, you know, the, the children's dentist. 
for a children's dentist and things like that. What do you think, Kai? For children in Africa. For children in Africa that need help. Oh, Let's oh, look at some pictures. Oh, yeah, you, you remember something? Let's look at some pictures. Here's a picture up here. Can you see it? Oh, it fades a little bit. But it's a woman with a net, and there's some babies inside the net. And those, that's mosquito nets. It protects children and, and, and grown-ups from m- malaria. Yeah, and when you guys have, uh, during vacation Bible school, you take up money and you go to help buy nets like that. Um, so that's one way that we have used money that the church collects. How else can we, you, what is that? Food. food. We support agencies that take food and give them to people who need food. So lots of food like that. What else does a church do? What, what is that, I wonder? Build houses, yeah. And that's some of our people building what's called a Habitat for Humanity house. And we help people, we come alongside people who need good, solid housing, and we help make that happen for them. What else does the church do? Who are those young people? I don't know, I don't remember seeing them around here before, but that's our church, isn't it? Those are um, college students, and our church provides lots and lots of scholarships, money to help young people go to college. What else do we do as a church? Who, oh my goodness, who are those people? That's us. That's you guys. Last Vacation Bible School, our church puts on programs and ministries to take, teach people about the love of Jesus Christ. And I could go on and on and on, but um, I only have 30 minutes to do the children's sermon, so I better stop now. So let's give God thanks for everything this church does because of the generous gifts of the people of God. Thank you, Lord, for this church. And everything that we can do together for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, thank you so much. Will you hand that to an usher who will need that money to put into our real offering plate today? Thank you, guys. Have a good time in Children's Church. The first reading is Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O family of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nation, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the people with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the seas resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. They will sing before the Lord, before he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his truth. The word of the Lord.
Thank you, Bell Choir, for leading us in worship in such a beautiful way today. Sometimes when they're playing, I think about how important each role is. If one of them didn't show up today, there would be a gap, a hole in the song. We wouldn't want that. It wouldn't be as pretty. And when I think about the work of worship, we all have a job to do, and the song that we offer to God needs every single person playing their part. And their part is prayer. We all are called upon to pray as part of our work in worship. So let us pray together and offer God our beautiful song this morning. Let's pray. We lift our song to you, O Lord. Our song filled with drama, filled with movement, filled with joy and sorrow, major keys and minor notes, and all of it coming together to bring you the song that we offer today, the song of our lives. We give you thanks for the song that you have put in each of us to sing. And we ask for the strength and the courage and the wisdom to sing it the way you would have us to sing it. To live our lives in a way that would please you. To become more fully the women and the men that you have created us to be. Help each of us live into that. To understand who that is and to become more fully that person. You have given so much, Lord. And so often we overlook all the blessings in life. We focus on our worries, on our anxieties, on the negative things. Turn us toward you. Shine your light into our lives so that we might recognize your beauty in the midst of ashes. We pray for our world. So many people around the world are in, the, in harm's way, whether it be through wars or pandemics. We pray, O oh Lord, for those that are suffering. As your church, we call upon you to bring them comfort. And we pray for those people working in harm's way, soldiers, doctors without borders, nurses, peacekeepers. We pray, O oh Lord, for your protection on the people who are trying to help your children. Give them strength for this day. Help us, O oh Lord, look beyond ourselves to give of who you have called us to be, to grow in generosity to the world, to those around, to grow in compassion, to care more. Help us, O oh Lord, grow us in you. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
our hearts to sing your praise, tune our hands to give back a little of what you have so richly blessed our lives with. Receive these gifts, use them for your peace. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing together hymn number 490, Take My Life, Let It Be. Second reading is from the New Testament, Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. <clears throat> then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. The word of the Lord. The ancient Hebrew tradition of debate is the context in which our New Testament lesson for the day comes. The ancient Hebrews loved nothing better, our forefathers as they were, 
than to gather together and to debate the sacred text that they believed were from God and the great moral questions of the day that they thought must be solved and to, if they had done well, be able to come out with an answer on the one hand and on the other hand. And even more, they loved when possible to debate these questions in the presence of one of the many rabbis of the day who happened to be around to get that rabbi's insight on the text or on the question. And sometimes, as appears to be the case in today's lesson, they also loved to trap the rabbi, to try to discredit one who was a young upstart, to try to defame that individual and perhaps even destroy their reputation as a rabbi. That seems to be the motive that's in play as they approach Jesus in the lesson we heard today. It is a trap that Jesus turns from a question with no real good answer to a life challenge that he suggests we must all follow. Now, what you probably heard was a very familiar text because you've probably heard it preached on time after time after time, especially in stewardship season. And I've even heard some of you say, you know, I'm tired of hearing about render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are God's. And I understand where you're coming from because I think the passage is often misinterpreted. Time after time, you've heard this passage talked about and used in the context of someone who's trying to make an argument for the separation of church and state. And while that may be a worthy Christian goal, I don't think that that at all is what Jesus is getting at in this passage. You've also heard this passage preached, and you've heard it preached in the context of the Christian responsibility to government, how we must both honor God and honor those who are our leaders. And again, while I would suggest to you that that might be a good Christian ideal, I don't think that's what Jesus is getting at in this passage. As already alluded to, you've heard this passage preached in stewardship season to tell you that just as you have to give to the government what the government is due, you should also give to God what God is due. And trust me, the church needs it. So it's a good Christian idea. But I don't think that's what Jesus is getting at either. And even still... If you're a good Lutheran, you've heard the passage preached around Luther's whole idea of the two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world, and how the two are both ordained by God but separate in what they intend to do. And again, while you may need some Christian understanding of that, I don't think that's what Jesus is doing in this passage. I think the key to the passage is Jesus' discussion of the image on the coin. In good Jerry Maguire-like fashion, when Jesus is asked the question, he simply says to those asking the question, show me the money. And when the money is shown to him, he says, well, the coin bears the image of Caesar. And so if Caesar asked for it, good enough. You should give it to Caesar. Simple enough. But Jesus then goes on, as good rabbis will do, to raise the bar just a little bit higher and to focus his listeners on the fact that just as there's an image of Caesar on the coin... There's an image of God 
in every human being that God has created, and therefore every human being owes to God the return of that image from their lives. What Jesus seems to be trying to say is that all human life should bear the image of God in everything that it does. That in fact, all of our lives should be given to God. If that is the case, if that is what Jesus is doing, then I think it becomes incumbent upon us in this time to ask the question, how well we are reflecting the image of God that has been given to us. How well we are returning to God that which belongs to God. When we look at our relationships, especially the difficult relationships, the people that are hard to love, how well are we bearing the image of God. When we look at our decision-making, especially those decisions that we're pretty sure are open and shut, cut and dried, but somebody had the unmitigated gall to raise some sort of ethical or moral concern about, how well are we reflecting the image of God? When we look at our financial commitments, and I'm not just talking about the portion of your finances that you decide to give to God and the church and to other good charitable organizations. No, I'm talking about all of your finances and all of your financial decisions. When you look at those, how well do they reflect the image of God in you? when we look at our engagement in the world, especially with those who find themselves on the margins of society and are very difficult to deal with and pose problems that are very difficult to solve, how well do we reflect the image of God within us? When we look at the decisions that we make in the dark corners of our lives that we think that no one else will ever see, how well do we reflect the image of God? If others were to look into those areas of your life, how clearly would they see the image of God? Or what image might they actually see there? Many of you know that some years ago, my mom passed away, shortly after I came here, in fact. And many of you were very good to go to the website of the funeral home and look at the obituary and leave words of kindness and encouragement. But you also did something else almost to a person that went to that website. The next time you saw me, you said to me, you know what? You look exactly like your mother. And I would say to you that minus the facial hair, <laughs> that is true. I reflect my mother's image. I find that the older I get, the more often I find myself looking in the mirror every morning. It is my mother who is staring back at me these days, and I bear her image. I also find, and my wife would testify to the fact, that most of my habits and ideas and the things that are ingrained in me that I can't seem to get away from are a reflection of the image of my mother for good or ill. Yes, I bear the image of my mom 
And there is nothing that I can do about it except that what I try to do is bear the best of her image for the most of the time that I have the opportunity. And I think, I think that is what Jesus is getting at in this passage today. I think that Jesus is saying to those who challenged him, whatever you do with the coin really doesn't matter. It's what you do with the image of God in you and how well you bear that that matters. And I think Jesus is challenging them to bear the best of the image of God the most of the time that they are able to do so. I think that that is what Jesus asks of us today as well. I think, in fact, that that is the real story of this stewardship season. How well will we bear the image of God and for how long? I think that in reality, that is the mission of this church. How well will we bear the image of God and for how long? And I think in truth that that is the real challenge of each of our lives. How well will we bear the image of God and for how long? May God give us the grace to bear the best of God's image for as long and as often as we can and may we take that as our challenge each day that we are granted life. Amen. Let us respond by singing together hymn number 668, God of the Fertile Field. Let us stand together, please. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. 
Lord, make me, even me, an instrument of your peace. Amen. And now as you go, go into the world knowing that you bear the image of God. And go into the world with the commitment that you're going to bear the image of the best of God for as much of the time as you can as you do service to those in our world. Go in goodness, go in grace, go in peace. Amen. Amen.